We have benefited tremendously from having a social, political, and economic system defined by work and the contribution of workers. At the heart of our progressive constitution are national values and principles of governance with social justice and all its dimensions, family at the core. As Kenyans, we find no problem whatsoever in accepting that social justice provides solutions for the most urgent and pressing issues of our time. I am delighted to note that this summit has not been shy to confront even uncomfortable subjects, including the need to make significant progress in democratizing the International Labour Organization as part of enhancing social justice all the way from the workplace to international relations as well as the urgent matter of just transition to give the world a better chance of actualizing the, the global aspiration of a better future of work. I commend you for recognizing the importance of these matters and addressing them in a committed, serious, and solution-oriented manner. The ILO system is worker-oriented in that it primarily represents workers' interests. Yet, labor rights are affected by both employment and unemployment. It should concern us very deeply that unemployment rates in Africa are some of the world's highest with many countries reporting between a quarter and a third of their populations not engaged in secure productive employment. As we speak about matters pertaining to work, we must also speak about the millions of jobless people whose voices cannot be heard at a conference like this. The aspirations of the unemployed matter and should be seen to matter, especially for ILO. Social justice for all makes it imperative to expand the social dialogue from the tripartite model, I suggest, to a four-sided forum of workers, the unemployed, employers, and government. Governments, employers, and workers must be equally concerned about the unemployment crisis and committed to finding sustainable solutions to it in order to bring the majority of the world's population into the ILO's traditional constituency. Majority of the world's unemployed people live in the global south, and especially in the continent that I come from. On average, Africa invests 30% of its annual budgets, or $150 billion on educating and training of its youth and workforce. Only 30% of them join the workforce, and all the way to 70% stay unemployed. What a waste. This perennial waste of human capital and productive opportunity must squarely form part of the most urgent concerns of workers, employers, as well as governments. Traditionally, it has always been a concern of the unemployed and government. I believe we will score serious breakthroughs when we incorporate unemployment and the unemployed into the social dialogue and therefore suggest that for social justice to become a reality and for this World of Work Summit to live up to its description, we must expand the scope of social dialogue to bring these millions of jobless people to work. Automation has disrupted the employment market, rendering many people jobless and eliciting profound concern that machines are going to drive humanity out of work and possibly into poverty. We have to find clarity on the question of whether technology promotes or undermines employment and job creation. We must exploit the opportunity of social dialogue to deepen and enrich our collective understanding on this matter and to reconcile our diverse positions on the implications of technological disruption in the workplace. In this regard, this forum 
provides the perfect platform to mobilize the best ideas into the development of policies and programs that promote new occupations and frontier jobs in the digital ecosystem. I would like to illustrate the immensity of the promise of this second social dialogue momentum by using the example of Kenya. To implement our bottom-up economic transformation agenda, we have committed significant investment to develop 100,000 kilometers of last mile fiber optic connectivity under our digital superhighway pillar. Additionally, we have entered a partnership to develop necessary infrastructure to provide 25,000 Wi-Fi hotspots at market centers throughout Kenya. Further, we are in the process of constructing 1,450 ICT hubs so that every county assembly in the Republic of Kenya will become a center of digital learning, business transaction, commerce, and work. We are committed to empowering Kenyans to tap into the emerging opportunities of the digital economy and to connect and engage globally while enjoying the comfort of their villages. Faced with an increasingly uncertain future, which abounds with relentless complexity, it is our duty as government and employers to do all we can to increase the number of people represented in conferences like this as workers. Social justice for all is never going to be free of charge or famously cheap. And we happened to have settled the most important unasked question of this summit. Who bears the burden of social justice for all? Social justice for all is never going to be free of charge or famously cheap. And we happened to have settled the most important unasked question of this summit. Who bears the burden of social justice for all? The answer is that for social justice for all to translate into meaningful transformation of the conditions of work, and for the World of Work Summit to fully articulate the aspirations of the constituencies represented here, we have to urgently invest in ambitious ways of getting millions of unemployed people, especially in the global south, to work and to take bold institutional measures to deliberately create opportunities for them. Let me give you an example. In Kenya, we are currently having a robust conversation. Many people working are asking me, how is it our business to contribute so that others can find work? And the stark answer I've always given them is that it is the taxes of those who don't work that pay our salaries. And it is not too much to ask us to pay for those, so that those who do not work find work. In Africa, we are now making serious moves in precisely this very direction. As matters stand, Africa contributes only 3% to world trade, even though it's home to 17% of the world's population. Intra-Africa trade presently stands at only 15%. Our continent's trading profile suggests that we have not started performing at a scale and level commensurate with our potential. And this undermines our capacity to actualize Agenda 2063 and the Sustainable Development Goals. At the same time, it is abundantly clear to all of us in this room that our continent has a vast opportunity for radical, radically transform economic productivity, thereby creating employment on an unprecedented scale. The most visible doorway to this opportunity is continental economic integration. We are consolidating the African market through the implementation of the Africa Continental Free Trade Area to be the world's largest free trade area with a population of 1.4 billion. The objective of FCFTA is to increase intra-Africa trade to between 40 and 50% and enhance our contribution to global trade 
to a level commensurate with greater productivity of our population. The magnitude and frequency of devastation arising worldwide due to extreme weather events is unprecedented. It can no longer be denied that these events are evidence of climate change caused by rising global temperatures, primarily driven by the emission of greenhouse gases. Since the Industrial Revolution, global temperatures have been rising. The fastest rise, however, occurred after 1970, with two-thirds of global warming taking place after 1975. And the ensuing climate change has unleashed adverse weather phenomena to wreak havoc in different parts of the world on a biblical scale. An average of 189 million people annually are affected by extreme weather-related events in developing countries. The latest UN climate report indicates that the daily lives of at least 3.3 billion people are considered to be highly vulnerable to climate change. People are now 15 times more likely to die from extreme weather than in years past. There could be, according to UNHCR data, 1.2 billion climate refugees by the year 2050. Floods, storms, wildfires, and extreme temperatures have become more frequent and more widespread. Parts of Western Europe, including Germany, Belgium, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands received up to two months of rainfall in only two days, resulting in catastrophic flooding in 2021. Hundreds of people were killed, trapped, or went missing in the disaster. Early this year, a single event, tropical cyclone Freddy, wreaked havoc throughout Southern Africa, leading to floods which killed hundreds of people, displaced thousands of people in Malawi, Mozambique, South Africa, in our continent. In West Africa, floods affected 3.5 million people with 800 deaths and destroyed over 600 hectares of farmland. In the Horn of Africa, where I come from, the drought of unprecedented intensity following five consecutive seasons of failed rain led to extreme food scarcity and water stress, which caused the deaths of millions of livestock and wildlife, seriously setting back economic growth in our region. It is no longer tenable for us to continue the toxic conversation of North versus the South. Who did what? Who contributed, who did not contribute? Who is suffering, who is not suffering? Who is suffering more, who is suffering less? that conversation is no longer unhelpful. We are in this existential threat together. The global south, as much as the global south, is in trouble. On this matter of climate change, there is no developing or developed countries. We are all developing. In the global south, we have renewable assets that can be useful to the global north. In the global north, you have technology and financing that can be useful in unlocking the potential of green energy, green industrialization, green manufacturing from the global south. Working together in a win-win arrangement is what will get us the solutions we are looking for for climate change. Efficiency demands that global production under a, zero, a net zero uh, conscious paradigm must shift to Africa and Global South. This also offers us the irresistible opportunity to reverse the climate emergency and make Africa the green factory of the world, transforming the world's largest unemployed population into highly productive constituents of the ILO movement. This is the conversation we shall be having next week in Paris with my sister Motley. During the global stock take, it is the, con it is the discussion that we will be having in Nairobi in the Africa Climate Summit in September. And hopefully, it is the discourse we shall finally conclude and underline conclude at COP28 in Dubai in December. 
to actualize the new paradigm shift in global growth and development, a new development financing architecture is an imperative. It is not tenable, and in fact, I dare say, it is fairly absurd to confront a threat of the magnitude of climate change without a financial mechanism that directs resources on a scale and with the urgency and consistency and speed demanded by this existential We can and must realign our international financing framework to provide us with a strong fighting chance in the war against climate change. What I propose is neither wishful nor unheard, or nor unheard of in terms of nature, scope, or speed of necessary change. Existing financial system, which has been in place for 78 years, and I'm talking about the international multilateral financial system that exists today, it was crafted out of a series of meetings that took place in a small town called Bretton Woods in the United States over the course of only one month. It just took one month for us to come up with the financial architecture that exists today in July 1945. Let me give you another example. In 1989, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, it took European leaders only six months to set up the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. More recently, another example, in June 2022, less than four months after the beginning of the war in Ukraine, Germany modified its fundamental law to enable it to raise $110 billion to strengthen its defense in a matter of days. These serious crises were addressed through quick, resolute action by determined leaders. This is evidence of what can be done when stakes are high enough. The stakes have never been higher now in the existential crisis that is climate change. There is no reason why setting up appropriate financial mechanisms should take any longer. Between now and COP28, we have more, th more time than we need to design and implement a new architecture of international development financing institution that is responsive to the urgent needs of our moment. Effective climate action which depends on decarbonizing global manufacturing and greening global industrialization, which in turn also relies on the actualization of a greater role for Global South and Africa, is a social justice moment that must not be wasted. I encourage us to remain focused, be more determined, and inspired to use this momentous forum for social dialogue to make social justice for all a reality by making our existential crisis the unprecedented and unrepresented regions of the world and the entire community of the unemployed visible and relevant to our discussion. Social justice for all is a matter that we cannot afford to neglect, underrate, or avoid. On this grand global stage, at this momentous summit, we are at the right place and at the right time. What remains is for us to rally strong and make a collective resolution to do the right thing. For this moment, right refers to our decision, its timing and expeditious implementation. The right decision must effectively respond to the existential emergency confronting us and must fully take into account the five social justice moments I have outlined. Unemployment, the unemployed, opportunities in just transition, and new age digital economy, climate action, and the overdue reform of international financial architecture. I thank you.